Welcome back to DWeb Decoded, your guide to navigating the decentralized web. My name is Aaron Stanley, and today I'm joined by Harrison Hines, who's the co-founder and CEO of Fleek. We talk about the opportunities in decentralized web infrastructure, how Fleek is setting new benchmarks for performance and developer experience, and how it's pushing beyond traditional web services to offer fully decentralized alternatives. Harrison, it's great to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Excited to chat. Amazing, amazing. And uh, I love your Puerto Rico hat. Uh, it's making me quite envious. Thank you. <laughs> um, so anyway, we'd love to just dive in here and learn a bit more about your background and a little bit more about about Fleek. So maybe you can just introduce yourself really quickly here and uh, give us just some, you know, kind of your your professional trajectory here in crypto, and then we'll uh, we'll talk a bit more about Fleek. Yeah, sure. So I joined the space uh, in like late 2016. Um, prior to that. Um, I had helped build a equity crowdfunding platform that was called Seed Invest. It was in New York. Circle ended up acquiring it, um, but that was around the 2014 Jobs Act, and you know, uh, I was I thought crowdfunding was a cool concept, but the regulation kind of never allowed it to take off. Uh, but so then, when I saw Ethereum and the first use case that was really taking off were these sort of decentralized crowdfunding sales, um, I hadn't. Uh, a thought that, you know, this could actually be what crowdfunding was supposed to be, but it's probably going to need some like, you know, standardization and, and, and kind of like professionalization. Uh, and so, uh, that's when I met Joe Lubin and, and consensus and, and started a project called token foundry at a consensus that was basically trying to do that, you know, just help with, uh, trying to find good ways to launch tokens and distribute tokens. And um, so did that for most of the ICO days for about two years, but then sort of realized wasn't as interested at, on like the decentralizing Wall Street side of things, was was a lot more interested on like the decentralizing the web uh, side of things. And, and, and so that's where we, uh, when we left Consensus and started Fleek, uh, that's where we, we decided we wanted to focus, but uh, back then, there wasn't a lot going on on that side of the ecosystem. So the only technology back then that really, um, you know, sort of felt like it had any staying power was uh, IPFS. Um, so then that's kind of how we got started. And yeah, I'm going to pause there because I went a little bit past intro to history. So yeah, just... No, that's great. Let me just pause. There. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> great context. Great context. No, it's super interesting. Yeah. I didn't. Re I didn't. I didn't realize you were. Uh, you were involved in Seed Invest. I remember the platform from back in the day, but I didn't realize you were involved in that. I, it's, it's funny because I actually got my my start in crypto uh, when I back when I was a reporter. Uh, someone, you know, I got a call from like editor at CoinDesk, and they wanted me to do a story about like this, you know, kind of crowd like ICO crowdfunding type of story, and I was like, huh, that sounds. First of all, it's like, what the heck's an ICO? Uh, and then second of all, it's like, oh, this reminds me of all this like of Jobs Act, equity crowdfunding things that were happening back in those days. Uh, but yeah, it is unfortunate that, that that never like really achieved the potential that I think it had. But I guess that's a whole other conversation. Um, but yeah, here in in for this show and in Filecoin land, we do talk a lot more about kind of the decentralizing the web versus decentralizing Wall Street. So uh, with that, we'd love to maybe maybe just give us like you know, before we really dive into like just the mechanics of Fleek, it would be great to just talk about like, what are the problem? What's the problem that you guys like really set out to solve here? And um, what was, what was like, what was the problem you identified? And then, you know, what's your approach to solving it here? Yeah, I think, you know, just uh, in the four or five years now in, in sort of building Fleek and, and building largely on top of other decentralized web infrastructure protocols. Um, I think largely the, the thing we noticed was almost every Web3 protocol today still has to leverage Web2 cloud or CDN or some sort of Web2 augmentation to achieve perform the performance that sort of users and developers demand. And so everyone's using Cloudflare in front of their network or their RPC. Everyone's using Lambdas or some sort of, you know, just like... Um, supporting infrastructure to actually make the network function, whether it's the gateway or the boundary nodes or whatever, you know, might be. Um, and so we're, we're always trying to think of like, how is it possible that you could, you know, potentially ever solve that? 
Like, will that just be something that you just can't solve because decentralized networks, you know, you can never match the performance of Web2 because, you know, they control all the servers so they could do things, you know, and not need, you know, secure handshakes for everything and stuff like that. Um, But then, uh, like, so that was really the problem was, uh, you know, like, we saw a lot of these decentralized web infrastructure networks launch. We built, we're the largest builder on several of them, IPFS, Filecoin, Internet Computer. Like we're big early to, to several of those ecosystems. So got to see and learn a lot. But yeah, that was kind of, you know, like, uh, could this performance layer of the stack, you know, potentially, could you build a, a network that heavily optimized for performance and potentially meet you know, web two. Um, but then we started to think, you know, if you look at other networks that decentralized, you know, even centralized ones like Uber or Airbnb, you know, sometimes when you, when you do decentralize the supply side, you actually get performance gains. And, and so, whereas a lot of networks really like try to leverage decentralization as, as a security advantage, what we really kind of wanted to, to, to test out is could you potentially leverage decentralization uh, as a performance advantage, you know, in a similar way that Uber leverages decentralization as a performance advantage because they could get you a car faster in more geographies and have more dri- because they have more drivers and more locations closer to the people requesting cars. So edge computing follows a lot of that same logic. And, you know, so that's really where things started was if you look at Web2 edge computing today, a lot of them are just uh, built on top of AWS. They just set up different instances in 30 different AWS data center locations or something like that. Uh, And that's what Web2 edge computing is. Well, that's kind of the current state of it. They went from like one server to 30 servers. They can't do real edge computing just because it's not economically feasible to do it in a centralized structure. Um, and so that's really where we're excited to see like, okay, if you could, you know, run a system like this algorithmically, um, you know, and, you know, following a lot of the same logic as Uber and other networks kind of before it, could you, could you kind of, you know, not only show you could, um, you can meet web two performance, could you actually potentially exceed it? Um, and at the same time, probably drastically reduce costs. So that's kind of like, okay. You know, is is this the end state of cloud computing or, you know, are we about to witness, you know, another evolution where now these decentralized networks, similar to what you're seeing on the financial infrastructure side of things with Ethereum and so on and smart contract platforms, for a lot of the same reasons that infrastructure is better than centralized infrastructure for banking. You know, we think that by the end of this decade, it might, you know, seem a little bit weird to build any sort of meaningful software on a platform controlled by a corporation or, you know, in a jurisdiction that, you know, they can't trust or know what's going on behind the scenes. So that's really, you know, where we think decentralized web infrastructure is just being held back largely by performance and developer experience. And so that's really the two main issues I think we're, we're setting out to address the performance side with fleek network and on the developer experience side with the fleek platform, and just, you know, making it where it, we could just really compete on on traditional metrics like cost and performance and, you know, the no corporate nonsense side of things that you get with the Web3 cryptographic guarantees um, and, and you know, kind of see if, yeah. No, I love how that, uh, I love where you're taking this, right? Because it really dovetails in with a lot of these broader deep, you know, deep in narratives that we're, we're hearing, you know, even just at ETH Denver and just a kind of across crypto right now, generally, I think people are realizing that, hey, this might actually be kind of that, uh, that, that long sought after like killer use case for these types of networks, right? And I um, was hoping we could maybe dive a bit more into like, just like the product that you have, that you've built, like what you've built here. And then and maybe for folks who maybe aren't really like super immersed in this world, like how does, how does what you guys have built kind of differ from uh, like traditional web hosting or traditional infrastructure providers like AWS, Cloudflare, all these types of things. Like how, how, like how, what, what's like, what's the, the benefits of using a product like this versus, versus a centralized solution? Um, I guess uh, both on like kind of the philosophical side and then also on the practical side. Yeah. So I would say, you know, that's really where, 
you know, our goal is not to be like a Web3 edge network. Our goal is that we think that we could potentially have, you know, the best performing, lowest cost, best global coverage edge network that is is useful not only to the 25,000 Web3 developers, but also to the 25 million just web developers, period. Um, and so like what we've built so far, it's like a lot of people know us today as like Fleek, the IPFS hosting platform. And so that's our bread and butter. We host maybe like 60,000 plus apps or sites today. Um, and But that's, you know, largely just using AWS Cloudflare behind the scenes. Um, and so, yeah, for all these years, you know, we had looked at other protocols, like how could we decentralize Fleek's own stack and the service, and uh, you know, Fleek provides. Um, and, you know, that's really what drove us to, to Fleek Network is, you know, understanding there wasn't something available. Where could you host a Next.js app on a Web3 protocol and achieve Web2 like performance. It didn't exist. We, you know, we looked, we tried. A lot of people are, are bottlenecked by consensus in terms of request times. You know, there a lot of Web3 is counting request times in, in blocks. And, you know, like to really compete with Web2, you, you need to be in like the, you know, tens of milliseconds to really, you know, be at the level of a Cloudflare or a Vercel or an AWS or, or any of these players. So, but that's really where like we think we will have an advantage is we we demonstrated it in the performance results we shared a few weeks ago after our last test net but we've proven it's possible for fleek network to outperform web2 clouds um, but it's a lot different to prove you could do it at scale so like we still have work to do to prove that we could do it at the scale of an aws or vercel but at least in an early test and we open source the testing, you know, methodology and, and repo. So if anyone wanted to use the script and test it themselves, just testing something like serverless functions on AWS to Vercel to Fleet Network, we're able to outperform them even in multiple scenarios, cold starts, in cached results, different geographies. On average, we were like two to three X faster than Vercel and about five X or six X faster than AWS. And so like that's really our play here is like we don't want you to use Fleek over AWS or Cloudflare just as a sympathy, you know, Web three alignment uh, reason. We really think that we have, we could deliver a compelling infrastructure product to the market that is a lot lower cost. Like where we're seeing success early on, for example, is is like and where our focus is is like we, we don't really view ourselves as competing with any other Web three protocol. You know, we're sort of in this unique position where we add value to almost every other Web3 protocol because everyone needs hosting. Everyone needs CDN and like the services Fleek Network offers. Everyone's using. And it so like we're going after the parts of Web3 to start that like currently sit on Web2 cloud platforms. Those could be things like nodes, you know, provers, sequencers all the apps, all the IPFS, infra like there's a lot of just uh, roll up infrastructure. There's just a lot of, of things right now sitting on web two cloud platforms. And, you know, it's like with uh, now that data availability is a solved problem from a cost perspective. The next big challenge is getting the prover cost down because running these things on Google cloud and stuff is, is extremely expensive into the seven figures a month, if not more. And so that's really where we think, you know, and they also have the web three concerns of regulatory, you know, considerations and censorship considerations of running this critical infrastructure on cloud platforms. So that's really where I would say, you know, when we when we look at ourselves compared to to Web two, it's like we just we just think that when it comes down to tra traditional cost and performance and developer experience considerations, that we will be able to compete on a level with them, if not, you know, potentially provide something better in terms of performance and cost. Yeah, I love the way you're thinking about this because you're approaching it not from the vantage point of like, oh, this is just kind of like a fun toy that, you know, Web3 enthusiasts or whatever, you know, can use as kind of an opt out or whatever. You know, you're actually, you're kind of, you're, you're gunning for like, you know, you're thinking of this as the big picture, right? You're looking at this like, hey, like we need to just build something that is 
just flat out better than like what exists now, like in terms of performance and what, like, it's not just yeah, like, oh, I, this is just kind of a fun thing that like web three kind of bros can use that if they, if they don't want to use, you know, the existing system. So I think that's really like, I, I admire that, that vision that you've, that you guys. Have yeah. I think forward. to come like to compete today as a, as a new protocol or web three sort of, uh, like network, uh, I think in the old days, you know, you could build the infrastructure layer and then not worry too much about distribution because, you know, there wasn't much out there at the time. So when Ethereum launched, yeah, you could get a, a community of people to, you know, build all the layers on top. But, you know, I think nowadays you really have to think about it a lot more like how, you know, Helium's found success, which is like, okay, you have this network, but, you know, if you really want to compete, like you've got to you've got to build and, you know, kind of like with how it, like Helium Mobile, it's just, it's a product just like AT&T. And, you know, it's like if, if you go to that website, it's, they're, they're not throwing like airdrops and running nodes in your face. It's, you know, they're asking you if you want a, an iPhone to try to entice you to switch to, you know, Helium Mobile. It feels a lot more like a product that's, you know, trying to be sold to an end customer. And so, yeah, that's, you know, really how, how I think we approach it is, is, um, you know, we, we think for web two and web three developers that this could be just a better infrastructure option for building software for, yeah, web three devs, web two devs, AI agents, whatever it might be. We just think that we, like, if you look at the data and just this whole edge migration, like when you say like, how do you compare it? I think if AWS or Cloudflare, any of these web two platforms were to start over today, like what they would build at the absolute base layer foundation of a new cloud platform is a CDN because that's the most common denominator across every web service you use. You just want fast movement of data. So And so that's really where I think like Fleet Network is just architected the way a modern cloud is architected. If you look at any of the, of the good you know, modern dev platforms or infrastructure platforms, most of them are all edge optimized, you know, multi-location, like, um, and so I just think like what's pushing that is, is, is people chasing performance gains. Like Google has all the data. If your website loads in three seconds, instead of one, you lose a third of customers. If it loads in five seconds, instead of one, you lose 90% of your customers. So it, it's, it's very like, if you're an, an internet business or service, it makes a lot of sense to try to make sure your application or your APIs or whatever operate as fast as possible. And so that's where this migration, you know, moving to the cloud was the big thing the last two decades. Now everyone's moving to the edge. But as I mentioned, there's these things holding back edge computing that come from some of the limitations of just, you know, trying to go after an endeavor like that and set up a network like that using a centralized structure. But so, yeah, I think like, you know, that's really where we see this, like, you know, you see everyone, you, you see a lot of tailwinds behind the edge CDN, one of the fastest growing categories of web infrastructure, a $300 billion annual market by 2028 across edge compute and CDN. Next.js, Vercel, all this, all this, all the modern devs and frameworks and stuff, it's all going in this direction. Uh, the serverless edge and, and Web3 is, is starting to play out in the exact same way. You look at rollups, it was single server, you know, just running the sequencer. Now what's everyone talking about? Oh, it's going to be these multiple, you know, sub rollups running in these different, it's going to scale exactly like Web2, which is microservice driven accessed via API, accelerated by the shared performance layer. And so that's what Web3 is now modularizing. Everything's accessed via API, turning into microservices, but you're missing this sort of shared performance layer. And so that's really like where Fleek and Fleek Network, we think, can come in. But yeah, it's like, you know, the infrastructure and the network is one thing. But with the Fleek platform, what we're really trying to accomplish is to match that developer experience where you don't have to sacrifice anything. You don't, if you don't want to care about wallets or tokens or anything, and you just want to come in, you want to see what things cost. You want to see what features and products are offered and link your GitHub and, and move over your Vercel site or your Lambda functions or whatever it is. We just want there to be zero friction so that there's no other argument for why a developer would not you know, at least be open to trying this. Cause yeah, that's one thing it's like, I haven't seen a web three protocol successfully 
uh, win over the open source developer community yet. You know, like the Web2 open source developer community. And it's huge. And it, that's crazy to me. But it, it shows that a lot of these Web3 protocols are taking, you know, that the approach should be reconsidered. And I think that's sort of how we are thinking about things. And I think the changes you'll see over the coming months is if you go to the Fleek website today, it's very Web3 developer focused. It talks about IPFS and ENS and a bunch of these other things. And that really alienates Web2 developers. And so I think that's a lot of the problem you're seeing where, you know, you just have to focus on merit. You have to build a good product. And if it performs well and it's lower cost, and you give all these other benefits of censorship resistance and that, that I think good developers will, will, you know, will appreciate that. So yeah, that's kind of the approach we're, we're taking. So why do you think that just to kind of double click on this point, cause I think it's really interesting. Um, but why do you think the web three community has, has, you know, in your estimation failed to really establish that connection with the web two open source community, or maybe could you elaborate on what you mean by that? I mean, cause this, this to me has yeah. always seemed like kind of the Holy grail that all the, the Web3 protocols are trying to go after, like, oh, how do we convert these like Web2 devs to get them building stuff on our platform or on our on our chain or whatnot? And um, we just love your thoughts on like, like, why do you see this as as or why do you think it's been unsuccessful? I think it's largely a, a VC created problem. You know, they've they've shoved so much money into infrastructure um, that it's created this abundance of infrastructure, and like they've. Uh, I think a lot of Web3 protocols have have made a decision like to prioritize maybe the token over the product. Mm. Um, because, you know, when you go to a lot of, uh, it's a lot of Web3 jargon. Uh, it's very hard to understand what is the product, who is it for, what's it cost, how does it perform, how does it compare to other things. Um, there's a lot of friction to onboard. Um, it, the onboarding is very, very catered to a Web3 crypto native uh, on, you know, so it's like, uh, I think, yeah, they're, they're getting this false sense of product market fit because of these incentives created by just everything, VCs, airdrop farming. And so I just feel like the metrics that a project is judged on success today is largely like FDV. Um, and so I just think that that creates, uh, adverse incentives that leads to creating subpar products for developers. Um, and so that's really where, um, yeah, I, I see the, yeah. So the, so the web two community, open source community is kind of looking at this and saying like, look, there's not really like a there there, or this is, it, there's, there's just kind I think of a when lot you of have like, something, I think when you present something interested, they're interested. Uh, just like with, um, like, I think Akash has done a really good job recently repositioning themselves uh, for the AI GPU, you know, uh, just whole uh, saga playing out. But yeah, it's like, you know, um, they like, for example, they got Grok, uh, Elon and, and Twitter uh, open source Grok. They got it running on Akash within 24 hours. Uh, I think probably developers appreciated that and would try it out because it was available nowhere else. So when you start to focus on these things that Web3 can do that you can't do elsewhere, yeah, then I think a, a, a developer will try. What is it? You know, what are their options? They either want to try out Grok or they don't. So it's like if Akash is the only place that you could try out a, at Grok day one, probably developers are going to go try it out. But if you introduce friction to that equation for them to go try it out, that's where you start running into trouble. But yeah, I think, you know, and that's that's a good example of providing actual value to developers. We're not, I'm not saying we're great at it, but that's what we're trying to be great at. Um, because yeah, it's like the more you can add actual value to developers, the better off you'll be. And I think to most normal developers, these Web3 protocols don't all, like, cool, you could roll up this data to Ethereum. How does that help me convert more, you know, convert more users to download my, you know, it's like, it doesn't solve any problems, but if you can actually come with benefits, where are we seeing, you know, the, the Web3 decentralized infrastructure protocols succeed? Mostly right now, it's been cost savings. Oh, uh, you want cheap storage? You could store it on this network or you could store it here. And they're using token incentives to just subsidize it. So cool. Okay, that works. You know, Uber subsidized rides for a while. That that's a tried and true strategy. You could do that. Um, 
but not many have been able and security. You want this to be more secure. You could use this, you know, but I think uh, the performance one, if you could really, if you could really offer developers who, you know, just seeing the success of Next.js and Vercel, why are they all using it? Because it gets you SEO optimization and super fast loading out of the box. Zero config, you don't have to do anything. So of course you're going to use that because we just discussed the Google data. Three seconds, five seconds, that's a lot of customers, that's a lot of potential sales. You're letting walk right out the door because you're using a different framework and now you got to do a bunch of extra work. And, you know, it's like, so that's where I think, um, like, we're just laser focused on performance. We think we've already demonstrated we, you know, have a, a pretty good lead there in just architecting the protocol to optimize specifically. Per, like, if you look at a lot of these big Web3 protocols popping up, everyone's going to end up doing the same stuff. You know, it all boils down to compute and bandwidth and store, you know, so it's like everyone's just taking a different approach. But the communities that I've seen actually uh, take off and have staying power are the ones that do something unique at the very base and foundation of what they do. Celestia, data availability. Eigenlayer, economic security. Fleek is really just focused on edge and performance, like, you know, or like the CDN, like Cloudflare started as a CDN. Now it's not too different from AWS. So it's like, that's where I think, you know, as, as a protocol, like we are just laser focused on if we could be the best edge, the best CDN, the best performance layer, uh, and just go from there and be the only protocol that could house use cases like hosting Next.js apps performantly, you know, like if we could really be good at that and be better than anybody at that, even Web2, that we think that gives us a lot. You know, if we could run these provers more performantly and at a lower cost than than Web2, like, OK, we feel pretty good about our odds that, you know, this is compelling infrastructure that's unique. There's nothing like it in the ecosystem. And it should add value not only to the Web3 stack, but also the just the web in general. And so, yeah, that's kind of like big vision, but very small fish, like let's just block and tackle and execute and prove to Web3, you know, like we could add value with our existing customer base and IPFS hosting and adding Next.js hosting and just, you know, start there. And then, yeah, if, if, if it works, then yeah, we're in pretty good position. And I'd say with the fleet platform and the usage we already have, we're going to be bringing a lot of usage onto that network day one. Think about all those sites, all the CDN traffic, all the compute we're doing for build minutes, things like that. The fleet platform is the first basically enterprise customer of the network. And so mm -hmm. there's a lot of just usage and stuff that, yeah, I'd say, you know, when I look at some of these other decentralized infrastructure protocols and their usage compared to what Fleek's usage is today and what we'll be able to onboard to Fleek Network, you know, in, you know, gradually uh, over time as as we feel comfortable about the reliability and stuff. But, yeah, that would definitely put us, I think, in the upper echelon in terms of usage of a decentralized web infrastructure protocol. And I think similar to the protocols like MetaMask with swaps or Uniswap with their protocol, you know, the protocols that have really excelled are the ones that have, have decided to handle distribution at the layer above Helium with Helium Mobile, et cetera. So, yeah, I think, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that's really our goal with the Fleek platform is just make it as easy as possible for anyone who wants to leverage Fleek Network, the services built on the network, to just be able to, you know, have that seamless Vercel railway type experience where you could deploy, ship, scale, and, you know, you don't have to worry about any config or anything if you don't want to under the hood. Better performance. Just to clarify, off. like, like, what would you say would be the difference between like the Fleek platform and the Fleek network? Like, just to just like Uniswap, just like, yeah, the Fleek network is a decentralized edge network. So that's got you know node operators who are running edge infrastructure in different geographies, but completely sort of like the like it's just a back end. Like if you think of Uber, Uber's got this whole driver network. You don't see it as, a, you know, just someone taking rides on Uber, but they've got this whole infrastructure network out there. So the platform is just really the developer facing like one front end for the network. I, I assume in the future there will be multiple, you know, front end surfacing Fleek network functionality. Fleek is kind of just like what will make those hundred other platforms who want to, you know, integrate this functionality like a dream customer for us is Vercel. So the Fleek platform is just a way to make it easy for a potential future customer like a Vercel to switch out AWS 
for using Fleek Network for some or all, you know, of of their infrastructure, CDN, edge compute, serverless compute, whatever else they need. Um, that's a that's the dream. Like that's that's where we want to get to. But so yeah, similar to Uniswap, like they have Uniswap, the app or the mobile wallet. Those are all just distribution ways to get more distribution to the protocol. They've obviously went in a certain direction with monetizing at the application layer and the protocol, or they haven't monetized officially at the protocol layer yet. But yeah, that's created some adverse in, uh, incentives that we've definitely paid attention to. And I think don't want to end up in a situation like that. The Fleet platform is just a public good for the network to drive traffic and, and help with distribution and help others who want to use the network and add functionality or replace existing functionality, you know, into their platform super seamlessly. Um, so, yeah. Cool, cool. And then maybe talk a bit about uh, your user segmentation. Like you have said you have about 60,000 users using the platform currently or using the network currently. Uh, maybe just talk a bit about like who are these entities, users that are that are currently uh, using using the platform right now, and then maybe how do you see that expanding over the next couple of years? Like who are who are kind of the the, the target the, the the targets you have lined up for the next couple of years? Yeah, so I would say um, it'll definitely change a lot because basically the big transition we're going through right now is like you know basically static fleet to full stack fleet. In the past, we were just doing static hosting and storage. Um, now with Fleek Network, we can basically cover the full stack. Also with other protocols, like, you know, the Fleek platform won't just surface Fleek Network. Like Fleek Network is probably best used in conjunction with other protocols. Like the majority of use cases on Fleek Network might be pairing it with other networks, much like Lambda function. Like, you know, it's like you pair it with like, or a CDN. It's like, it's used to accelerate a core service somewhere else. It's not, not, it's not the service itself. So like, uh, like the, where fleet network finds success. Yeah. might be as an augmentation layer for other protocols rather than, you know, people building full things on fleet network, but that's where things might change because yeah, today, a lot of the usage is hosting and storage people using just IPFS infrastructure. Um, but what we're seeing already, like with fleet network, like the, the idea is that you could build a platform kind of like what the EVM and smart contract platforms are to decentralize financial services, building a platform like that for decentralized web and edge services. No one has really tried to go after that, like specifically everyone, like we said about, you know, the Web3 branding and the airdrops and getting sucked into that token stuff. Like a lot of people are getting sucked into DeFi and, you know, wanting to really play a role and because everyone judges things on TVL and stuff. So everyone's kind of like, you know, getting sucked that way. But we really just want to focus on like web edge services and judge performance based off of things like that. But the majority of usage, yeah, today is a lot of static site hosting. But if you think about it, probably 75% plus of app of the projects in Web3 use Next.js. And so up until now, you know, using Fleek, you would lose the benefits of Next.js because when you when you convert a Next.js app into a static site, all the image optimization, the server side rendering, all that, you know, all that magic that Next.js does, you lose. And so the big next thing we'll launch on the next test net and in, in the platform will be starting to support Next.js. So that opens us up, not just to the Web3 market, we're currently not servicing because they're still on Vercel or another platform because they don't want to lose their Next.js performance benefits. It also opens us up to the much larger Web2 Next.js market that is frustrated with Vercel because of mostly cost reasons. Like they have a beautiful platform. They're pretty much the Apple of development, but yeah, they're expensive. Like they charge, you know, three, four X what you, you know, probably pay AWS because, you know, they make it pretty and seamless and they're saving you a lot of developer hours. So you're paying them in infrastructure, what you'd probably pay on AWS in human, you know, people hours to, build and maintain that infrastructure and, and get you those performance gains. So, um, and manage the infrastructure if you tried to host the next JS app yourself. Um, but yeah, where, what we're starting to see with the network is like, like I was saying, like we have services, you could kind of think of those like smart contracts on a smart contract platform, but we don't use a VM. Uh, you're not as bounded to like what you could do like with services, um, 
they're not as clunky because everything again is trying to be optimized for low latency, high performance. So we don't want to carry a lot of bloat uh, in any regards. Um, but yeah, like we're starting to see, like I said, use cases like running provers on the network or people building like, like right now. And a segment we think is going to be a big segment for us is like your, your options right now, if you want to build decentralized web services is essentially like you have to build your own protocol. Um, and so like, for example, with Eigenlayer and AVSs, but there's other things, there's tons of cool frameworks coming out for, you know, all types of micro rollups or roll apps, like all these sorts of things, but that infrastructure needs to run somewhere. So the recommendation today is to run it on AWS. And so if you're building an AVS, for example, you still have to build your node software and you have to maintain it and you have to continue to advance it and and do devops like if you're a node operator to run that infrastructure and you're running it on AWS so you have to rent servers so like you you have like your costs are sort of fixed you know it's like it costs this much to rent it to run this node for this month so with fleet network like you could rent economic security from eigenlayer but where fleet network really thinks we could fit in and be useful is like you could kind of rent your node infrastructure from Fleet Network. So instead of trying to build your own network and having every network with its own siloed nodes in different geographies, they don't communicate, none of those networks are geographically optimized for performance, and you'd have to build and maintain the whole thing. Or you could just use Fleet Network for your node infrastructure layer and rent economic security from Eigenlayer, and now you don't have to build that node software. And you get the benefits you get from, you know, instead of rolling your own chain, being a smart contract or a roll-up. So that's really where we, we see ourselves fitting in is, you know, like building, like same, same thing you see playing out with alt L1s becoming L2s or roll-ups. For a lot of these networks that don't get the transaction volume and, and, and hit a certain scale, like, the fees and the inflation you're paying to have your own validators makes no sense. And so you see all these middleware networks and they think like, like to have your own network of geographically distributed nodes just to secure your doing one, you know, type of niche ZK proving or sequencing or one type of compute or running one type of VM. Yeah, maybe. But I think for a lot of the reasons you're seeing people realize it's easier to be a roll up or rent economic security than pay for my own security. I think with Fleet Network, you're going to see a lot of people come to the same realization that I could get to market much quicker. This infrastructure is going to perform much better than what my network or own infrastructure is going to perform at. It's much cheaper. And for my node operators, they can now switch to usage based pricing. You know, because now, like, no, like Fleet Network, if, like if you're a node operator for an AVS on Eigenlayer, you have two choices. You could run the, the node on, on AWS, or if that AVS made it compatible with Fleet Network, you could just outsource the work when it's your turn to Fleet Network. Maybe it doesn't work for every AVS, but a large chunk of them, yeah. So now you could completely shift, not only for the AVS creator, you can create a lot of benefits where saying, don't go your own route, You know, don't try to go roll your own network, do this to start. It's much simpler. You'll get everything you need to prove concept. If you get big enough, maybe go roll your own network then. But the idea is Fleek Network could support you know applications up to as big as Netflix or Tesla in the future. That would be the end goal. But yeah, you know, like that's the way we sort of think about things. Is yeah, I think there's this category of people who want to build decentralized middleware and and services for you know watchtowers or seek all this type of supporting infrastructure for how web three is going to scale all those networks you know i think are going to you know face not all of them some of them will definitely hit breakout success and maintain their own networks and security budget but for a lot of them i think yeah a platform like fleek network could be a very interesting infrastructure option to build your protocol or your middleware service on or you know part of it on and, you know, not have to take that on yourself and, you know, probably end up with something not as optimized, not as good coverage, twice as expensive, twice as hard to maintain, you know. So that's really where we think we could uh, we could. And we're already starting to work with some early projects and AVSs uh, using Fleek Network for exactly that reason. Fleek Network handling the infrastructure and there'll be an AVS, Eigenlayer AVS, rent economic security from them. But yeah, like run the nodes on Fleek Network. 
this is super interesting and it, it's really inspiring too actually like I'm, I'm like this is you've you've sort of piqued my interest and really want to dive into some of these subjects more just because you've you're 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 hitting the nail on the head on like so many kind of critical like problems that are facing just like web3 generally and just the internet generally so I, like i really love where you're going with this and i love the the, the vision that you have for this as really just I mean, it really dovetails nice, dovetails nicely with this deep in movement, but you're not only just thinking about this in terms of how do you take existing kind of web two, you know, services and, you know, create this in like a web three distributed way, but it's really like, okay, how do we actually make web three even more, more distributed and more just resilient and, and more performant as well. So like, I love how you're, you're kind of attacking it from multiple angles here. Um, Maybe to kind of wrap up, like I just like to give you the last word on on you know what should we expect to see, you know what's ne- what's next in the roadmap over the next like twelve months or so, uh, and then any other final thoughts that you wanna you wanna give. Yeah, I would say, um, well, you know the big milestones for us in the next few months are releasing like an official test net that would be you know pretty much mainnet uh, ready from a reliability and uptime and, and sort of performance, uh, standpoint. Um, it just wouldn't be, you know, well, we're kind of slowly rolling out the node side of things. Um, but yeah, I'd say, you know, the big things with the next test net are just, that are going to be really exciting are, you know, starting to demonstrate some use cases that just aren't possible today in web three on other protocols, like the next JS application hosting and just, you know, demonstrating performance on par with, with web two and, and that'll be just really cool. Cause it's really easy for people to touch, feel, you know, see, you know, it work. And, and, uh, so that one we're excited about. Um, but also just starting to just open up the whole services side of fleek network, largely a lot of the building, even this next JS use case, like that's just a service that the fleek platform team built as an early POC of the types of things you could build on fleek network. And so that encompasses many sub services for image optimization or server side rendering. So the cool thing is the composability you get with smart contracts where, Oh, this person built a lending protocol. So I could leverage that and, you know, use it within my application. That same sort of magic can happen on fleek network. So as we keep adding new core components and new functionality and people keep building services, you know, that just gives new developers or existing developers more tools, more things that they can now work with or use. Um, and so that's, I think, pretty exciting. Um, and where we think the Fleet platform could really add a lot of value is is in helping developers, A, to just deploy new services, but then also get discovered and easy, like allow others to easily utilize these services. Because, um, yeah, I think, you know, it's just like smart contracts or DeFi saver. You know, they've got all these recipes to, you know, close a MakerDAO vault and open up a liquidity, you know, vault in one click. Uh, and I think, you know, web infrastructure and a lot of the things all these teams are building and using, it's a lot of the same components or functions to, you know, grab the CNS name or do that or do this. So, um, so yeah, I think, uh, I think you know, the, the fact that, we have an ability to to have this platform where whatever anyone builds potentially adds value to every other everyone else on the platform. Um, that's I think uh, yeah really exciting. So yeah, that's what I'd look out for. A few announcements of early services that you could expect on the next test net. But also I would just say you know I think like if you look at uh, Ethereum and the projects that really did well in the Ethereum ecosystem. It was the ones that went after the low-hanging fruit use cases that are super popular on centralized financial infrastructure, trading, lending, you know, all the all the big ones, Uniswap, Aave. Like it's not that it's easy to see. Like okay, those use cases are big in finance. They're probably going to be big in decentralized finance. The ones who are early and realized that were pretty successful. So. I just think uh, for any developer, you know, now there's a new platform where you could potentially build the services like equivalents of those lending, borrowing, but now for web and edge services, you know, all types of compute flavors for Cloudflare workers, serverless, func- like Lambda functions, all sorts of things, data ba- edge databases. There's all open source technologies where, yeah, I think, you know, there's a lot of opportunity now where, you know, you might not see like, yeah, Aves and Uniswaps and all these financial use cases on Fleet Network, but you might start to see, you know, an ecosystem of, of really cool kind of more web 
infrastructure focused projects start to pop up. And so, yeah, I just think uh, we're kind of, yeah, at the very beginning of that starting to happen and there's a lot of opportunity and, and yeah, I'm very excited to, you know, see that come to life. No, this is super interesting. I uh, really admire what you're doing. I mean, this, the division you've laid out and what you're trying to do is just, is just really compelling. And it's, it's, uh, I think you're hitting the nail on the head where, uh, which, what you mentioned earlier, where a lot of the folks have been kind of running toward these more of these financial applications, but there's a whole kind of wild west, like open terrain as far as uh, kind of the area that you're operating, which is, which is really just providing decentralized web infrastructure solutions and, you know, trying to just stimulate more activity in this area, which has been an area that, that has been maybe overlooked by some because it's a, maybe it's a little more complicated folks understand. And then B there's maybe not like an immediate as immediate of like a monetary return as there might be with some of the financial applications. Um, but it's, it's, uh, equally important nevertheless. So it's really cool to see you guys really as like the pioneers in this movement. So, um, like well done on that and, and wish definitely wishing you the best of success here. Um, if folks want to get in touch with you, learn more or with your team, like what's the, the best, uh, route for that? Yeah, I'd say either discord, um, or Twitter we're at fleek X, Y, Z. And also we have at, uh, fleek, I believe underscore network or fleek underscore net. Uh, sorry. Um, we might unify that, uh, in the future, but for now, um, I'd say those Twitter accounts and the discord, uh, are definitely the best places. Um, but yeah, also I would say look out on our blog or, you know, sign up for the newsletter because we're definitely going to be putting out a lot more content in the coming weeks uh, leading up to the next test net just to start educating developers on, you know, what Fleet Network is, what services are, how to think about it, the types of things you could build as services, some early use cases based on the initial functionality we'll have in this test net versus, you know, what will be included in mainnet. Um, and yeah, just, you know, really start to let people understand like what, what Fleek Network is and, and, you know, kind of what it's useful for. And, and yeah, so, but yeah, I'd say thanks for having me. And it was an awesome combo. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Harrison, really appreciate your time and I really appreciate your insights and uh, thanks everyone for watching and we'll see you next time.